Thank you. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, that's very exciting and a very nice way to begin this. Keep looking up. That's right. Do I've been look looking up? down. I do now. I've been looking down for decades, you know, and I brought people the morgue. And now I owe it to you to bring you something happy. Yeah. To let you know there really is hope out there and up there and, and that not everything is as awful as I've painted it. But, but I, think, I think it's an appropriate beginning for all this. I mean, we haven't even, I mean, you know. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the idea of space is up there somewhere. And although I wouldn't call this a book about space, um, it takes place in the exploration of space and the people that choose as their mission in life to go be, whatever that show was, to go beyond, what was that science? Star Trek. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Aren't you glad I came? I mean, like, I'm like so I mean, prepared. Like, no, but everybody. I'm so freaking prepared. Like, I don't even know the name of the TV show. Right, the space show. There. But um, is do you know, in my little town of Montreat, I was not allowed to watch that when I was growing up. It because was it was cons naughty to use naughty, naughty, naughty. So I only watched it when I was babysitting, and then I'd watch all the naughty crap I possibly could. But in fact, my fourth grade teacher is here somewhere. You know, my fourth grade teacher, can you imagine that? Um, wait, where are you, Mrs. Skidmore? She's, she's not going to, well, I don't know where she is. Are you up there? Do you, thank you, Mrs. Skidmore. Yeah. And do you know, she is the only teacher <coughs> I ever had that paddled me, which is why I invited her tonight. You know what I mean? It's kind of cute. But uh, do you remember that? Do you remember when I climbed out the window in the fourth grade and, it, and, and uh, this was not good because I did not prepare my re-entry? I went out the window and then I realized I had to go all the way to the front of the school, walk back up the steps and down the hall and back into her room. And when I did, there was a yardstick waiting for me. She didn't hit me very hard, but it was, it was, um, it was anyway. But she, all kidding aside, and this is very important, never... Never underestimate your ability to encourage people. And in the fourth grade, that was the first time anybody ever made me think I could write a story or draw a good picture. And that was great encouragement. Thank you for that. And, and I'll see you later. I think there are millions of people in this world who, who thank you for that encouragement. And you're right. I mean, it takes all you need is one person to see you, and it can right. change your life. Um, uh, I want to go back to the sci to that space show thing. Was this ever? Was this Star Trek the one? Thank yeah. you. I, I yeah. Just, yeah. I the one you, that was it's, naughty. It's, I don't even know why it was naughty. Why? Because he had pointy ears. Because of the sexy uniforms. Oh, the, the, and know. then the finger thing. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, don't, I say nothing. Is that obscene? I don't. know. I don't know. I'm guessing so. But was space? And the people who want to go to space, was that something you've always thought about? How did, like, as you said, you've been sort of down in the morgue for a, a lot of books. Um, and we've been down there with you and loving it. Um, so the question, yeah. So the question is, <clears throat> what made you go up? And, and can you give us, since this is an inside scoop, uh, a little history of this, the beginnings of yeah, this beautiful well, book? Yeah, it, well, it, what really happened is after, <coughs> after the last Scarpetta book came out, Chaos, um, I guess it was four years ago, uh, three years ago, whenever it was, a few years ago, when I just, I, I just didn't really, I didn't know what to do with Scarpetta 25, and I thought, you know what, I just need to take a break from this. I don't, and I just... I just didn't see, in fact, frankly, I, I, she wasn't even answering my text messages anymore. I mean, <laughs> she said, after all the shit you have done for me for 24 books, what makes you think I'd come back for more? <laughs> You've had me shot with a spear gun. You've had me almost murdered. She had her, her husband, her boyfriend got killed, and then he came back. She's really had enough. But anyway, so I thought I would just go do something different, maybe do screenwriting for a while. I just, I'm not going to do any more books, I said. Was so this I, supposed to be a, a screenplay? That originally I was going to, I was going to develop the whole quantum idea for a movie or you TV. You got a scoop. It really is true. And so two and a half years ago I was in London huh. and I was, you know, coming up with various ideas of things I wanted to do. And someone said to me, 
you know, there's talk of creating a female James Bond. And would you, you know, if that were to be such a thing, would you be interested in something like that? And I said, well, I mean, I frankly think I'm the only one to do that because I really do corner the market on modesty most days. And, <laughs> but I, it started me thinking, what would, who would that person be today? Like, who would Scarpetta be if I were creating her now, mm -hmm. instead of in the early 1980s? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, probably be NASA. You know, where's, where would I go that's new and different? And I had been, I'd gotten a tour of NASA Langley back in 2002, and I still had a contact there who's here tonight. Christine is somewhere, right? And um, Christine Belcastro, wait, right, NASA person. Yes, hello, you. <laughs> who, when I met her in 2002, had, she has an identical sister, twin, both of NASA people. Well, got back up with Christine. Unfortunately, Celeste was no longer with us, but this got me into the whole interesting thing about twins. Went to Langley, started doing all this, came up with this idea of these twins and that you get, but you get into uh, what, what is space all about? I mean, what, what does this mean, going into space anyway? It's not really just about rockets or just being in spacesuits and up on the space station, as wonderful as all that is. Why do we do this? Why do people like Christine and other people here spend their whole lives doing this? What's it mm -hmm. for? Mm -hmm. And as I started getting into all this, I have to say, it was, it's hard to explain it, except that it really changed me in many ways. I started looking up more, and I started asking the question, who are we and why do we do these things? I mean, I know why people kill each other. I know why we die, but maybe it'd be interesting to know why we live and where we think we might be going and what's all this really about. And what do I really think about eternal, you know, eternal life and death and all of this stuff, especially as I get older? And as I began exploring all this, it just has taken me to a whole new dimension. And I want to share with people that we all should be looking up and we all should be going to space. And space is for everybody. And we are space. We're made from space. And if we don't learn how to get where we need to go up there and take it very seriously, we're going to be in a lot of trouble down here because that's the gateway. Whoever owns things up there owns everything down here. And it is a race. And crime is headed that way, and it's probably already there, but just a different kind of crime. Because I do have to import it or export it as much as I can, I guess. But, um, but I got, so then um, I showed a treatment of this to Jeff Bell at Amazon because they've done such a great job with the Ripper book. And everybody came back with the same thing. We want to do this, but you got to write a book. I, you know, got to write a book. Cannot be a screenplay. We want you doing a book. And I said, oh, rats, I have to write books again? And that's just what I've done. But truth is, I don't think I could ever stop writing books. Yeah. I, oh, I tried to. We're really to, glad to hear that. You know, I, I think crocheting and uh, macrame are really good things to <laughs> learn and Sure, there's plenty of time for that on the weekends or Sundays or something, but we do not want you to stop writing books. Yep. Well, thank you. <laughs> I think we have a super fan in the front row. Who's, every word I say, she's going to just say more. Never. Good. Love it. Um, for me, the experience of reading the book was about control. To me, it's a woman who finds herself in a situation from the moment it begins, she's out of control. A woman who is normally very much in control. And it, it, early on, she runs into this man who she's known for a long time. And as she's talking to him, she's talking about her twin sister and She's trying to find out information from him about where she is. And she says, she's been off grid, I'd admit, waiting for Dick to weigh in. But he's gathering information and not inclined to give it. Now, I, you know, I'm someone, as you all know, who sort of like literally will tell you everything about me like in 10 seconds. I, warts, I'll bring them out, I'll pour them out. You know, we'll have a good time. It, for me, being known for who I am, what I think, is crucial. It's the only way I can exist in the universe. But that absolutely stunned me because I have never gathered more than get, like, 
I, I found that fascinating. So to me, this book is a lot about control, loss of control, trying to gain it back, gathering information in the middle of a crime scene. So I just want to talk about control a little bit. OK. I don't like the way she's looking at me right now, just for the record. Well, no, it's because, like, um, because okay. the, a great mystery is all about control from a writer. How much information you're going to give us, how much you're going to make us wait. There are these little, um, what would you call these? Sorry, I didn't you know the name of Star from Trek. It. It's fine by me. No, no, no. But I, what are those called? I don't. Oh, well, that's the count, kind of like the countdown clock. Right, the countdown clock. There's a countdown clock graphic throughout the book, and it. Every time I saw it, my heart started to race. Because it gave me. Me too, because then I had to write the next scene. I didn't know where the hell I was going. <laughs> <coughs> I was pretty good about doing the cut and paste where it put that little zero, 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 zero across, and then it was like, oh, crap, I gotta put something under that now. But you've written a book where the main character walks into a situation where it feels like everyone else knows something except her. And it's complete. Well, it's only gonna get worse with her because you see, this. What you're going to find out, now you get a little hint of this in Quantum when she gets with General Melville. Now, Dick Melville, if anybody that's read Moby Dick, it's not, it is a coincidence. No, it isn't. But anyway, <laughs> you'll find out more about that the next book, too. But anyway, um, when, she, when she gets with Dick Melville, what you're beginning to get a sense, this guy's known her and her sister their, her, their entire lives. He's the, he's the head of Space Force. He's like a five-star general. He's been a family friend, knew the father at the Air Force Academy, but there's something very mysterious about all this. And he's known these daughters forever. And what you're going to find is, yes, there's a real control thing going on because he does know a, low, a lot, know a whole lot more about what's going on than they do because they're part of a sort of a master plan um, that, sh that is controlling them at the same time, they're going to end up being able to control a lot of things that other people can't, that you'll find out is where this is going. It's all got to do with technology and science and where things are actually going in the real world. Remember, I do the research. I run around with astronauts and Space Force people and the NASA people, all these folks, trying to learn what they're doing. Um, but you, you raise a question that I have pondered a good bit when you're talking about control. It also brings the whole notion in mind of how much free will do we really have, too? How much does she have? You know? Well, if somebody knows more than she does, she's not having a whole lot. And that's, that's called being manipulated a little bit, isn't controlled. it? Controlled. Well, that's it. She's also been controlled by having a very domineering identical twin. Uh, Karma's the flamboyant one, the fighter pilot. Uh, Callie's the test pilot. She's military police in the Air Force. She's a cyber investigator. Uh, what they call cyber ninja, which is, you know, you're using, you're doing spectrum analysis and you're, it's the invisible world you're worried about and that is the one that will kill you. Um, you should be worried about the invisible world, whether it's a virus or what satellites are doing up there. So um, she was very much overshadowed by karma. Right. And but part isn't of this, that the case with most this, sets of twins? Well, I think it can know. be. And I think what happened is this is like the tortoise and the hare type thing as what you find out as this thing progresses and you get to the end. If you really want someone who's going to save the day, it's going to be Callie because she just gets the job done. She just gets it done and not always in a pretty way, but damn it, she gets it done as you find out when you see the way this thing ends um, or it doesn't really end. It just kind of stops and gets you ready for the next one. Um, You're kind of known for that. I am. Why anybody accuses me of a cliffhanger is, is like accusing me of, of, of writing about dead people. And I go, what did you not know about me that you would even bring that up? So, but, but yes, control is... Uh, yeah, I felt, I felt her. I felt for her. I felt... I, I, I'm telling you, when, when she enters places and you know that other people know things ahead of you. It, it, it was a, for somebody who is, as you know, incredibly smart and is normally the one in control in these situations, I found it fascinating to put that character into a position where she's out of control. Something is happening to her. And I just found that to be a fascinating uh, sort of 
way in because it's compelling. And the way you write it, Natch, um, is, is, is just a, a, you, when you read it. Have we all read it yet? No. Do you even know what it's about? I haven't either. Would you let me know how it is? How it, I, I, Do you have a it. clue as to what it's about? Not, <laughs> okay, well, I have a lovely little gift bag for you, <laughs> which I will give you afterwards. Um, why don't you, just so that we're not talking in theory, a little more specific, why don't you just give a broad strokes, what they call in show business, an elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. Well, what I called in college master plots when you didn't want to read the book, but don't tell anybody that. I don't know how I know about that. You I mean just like heard a, about it. Kind of a <laughs> cliff notes kind of thing. Why don't you just give for those sitting here who are going like, wait, is it about space or control or like what's happening? Why don't you just give a, a little verisimilitude, a well, little time all, and place to the First of all, you book. cannot write about space without writing about Earth because there's really not a whole lot up there. Everything's down here, including the people that go up there. So you got to start with, if we're going to put a face on space, if you really want to know what's going on, then we've got to, it's got to be humans. And the humans that go up there, and who are these people, and why on earth did they do that? And, and I'm still asking some of them that. Why do you want a rocket under your ass? Most people don't. Um, I don't know. It sounds kind of fun. But uh, why, why do you want to... The, the things that these people have to do is really beyond extraordinary. It really is. And so... I want to know who are these people, why do they want to do this, and, and so you start with, well, who would this character be? And because I met the twins that I mentioned, I thought that was a fascinating idea. And the interesting thing is with quantum mechanics, it all fits with that because the whole notion of quantum computing and quantum is that in normal computing, you're basically doing, you have ones and zeros, and this does this and that does that, but they don't do it at the same time. In quantum computing, you can be in two different places at the same time, so to speak. You can do more than one thing at one time. It's like a third dimension that gets added. And what, and this is all true. I, I'm describing it in my own little pitiful way as best I can because it's very complicated. But it's one plus one equals three in quantum, in a way, because you're, you have another dimension of things, and it allows exponential uh, computations and things to be done so quickly. This is why the world is in the midst of this quantum computing race right now. Because whoever wins that, well, it better be us, because it's a really big deal. So I like the idea of twins, and I said, why not have them born of NASA parents who work at NASA Langley, and you put this person in research, a scientist, um, also a cyber investigator, and I was still kind of missing a piece for how I was going to make this work. And then I had the very great fortune of being at NASA Langley one day, and I was sitting in the cafeteria with some of the scientists, and this police person comes walking over with her big old Glock on and her pink handcuffs, of all things. <laughs> and, I, and she had a big old NASA badge on, and she's here, by the way. <coughs> Kim, you know who you are. And, uh, yeah, I hear her laughing. And anyway... I said, NASA police? I didn't really even know NASA had police. Well, let me tell you, they do, and I got involved in that part of learning. And by the way, these are really smart people. They're also, you do not want to get in their way or mess with them. And so I started learning about a different type of law enforcement that's a diff that's sort of focuses on different things than what I was used to. Police that protect uh, the rockets and the astronauts and also are worried about cyber attacks. And then I got involved with the Secret Service, and that's a big, and I, ha, and I, I can't tell you if they're here because that would be a secret. Um, but, you know, th what they're doing, because it's all about cyber stuff, mm -hmm. surveillance. I mean, it's not so much what you see, it's what you don't see and what's seeing you. You know, there are satellites up there that can, telescopes that can pick up images that are not much smaller than five feet in size down here on Earth from way up there. So even if you don't believe in this up there, it does believe in you. So you better, you might want to know about it. But so Cali and Karma, um, what happens is there's a, a government furlough and a, an evacuation from a storm. And, and a launch. And there's a launch going up in a, in a spacewalk, all scheduled at the same time with this big nor'easter coming in. Um, and she realizes there's a potential for a, a, a breach in NASA security and she gets on the warpath of dealing with that, and there's also gonna be a mysterious death. And let's just say, put it this way, 
It all escalates to where she pretty much has to save the space program almost by the end of the book. And it's pretty dramatic and it's fun, um, if I do say so myself. But as much, that's as much of a master plot as I can give you. But the most important but thing... But that's good. It's about character, too. It's oh. about these people. Well, and these sisters. So, of course, you have the driving narrative, which is Callie. But then... There's this mystery person who keeps sort of popping up in the story. You hear a lot about her sister. And you know she is, as I said, off the grid. Um, she, that, that's what Dick says to her. She's off the grid. So they're worried because they don't know where she is. And they are both in line for a very big promotion or very big Well, they're, they're, they're trying to get into the astronaut candidacy right, it's an program. Advan and they're, an they want advancement. To be, their whole lives have been focused on they're going to grow up to be astronauts and that they're someday going to serve in space with General Melville and who's the head of Space Force at this point. And, um, but now there's weird things going on that look like that could derail all that. And no, you don't meet the sister, the, the identical twin karma. She's, like you said, she's sort of on the lam. We don't know what's going on with that. You find out, you'll find out more about that later. But... Um, so that's, it's, it, it's kind of not the easiest thing to summarize, but... Well, no, but I mean, no, I mean, honestly, no great novel that pulls you in should be easy to summarize. I didn't mean it was easy. I just meant it would be good to sort of set the context of that it's not a book about space. This doesn't take place in space. Not yet. You'll no, be there in the next one. No, that's what I'm saying. That as well, you, you said, you kind of are in space at the end because even though it's a video feed, it's a live thing going on at the space station that I show you. That, but it, yeah. as you said, what happens up there is fed basically by people down here. Absolutely. And who are the people down here before we go up there? And I think that's what was so compelling to me about the book was I kind of thought I was going to read a space book, and it wasn't. It was a character book with these two sisters. And the book is also a lot about communication. It's very much about how we communicate as people, certainly within these structures that you're talking about with space and, and, and NASA and secrecy and secret service. And And I'm not used to all that secret stuff either. I'm like you. Anybody that knows me, you put in a penny, you get five gumballs out, and you didn't even want them. Right. But well, I'll tell you far more than you want to know. I know, but and but I'm but, not but, good but, with but, all that secret but, stuff either. But your main character is someone who keeps it very tight. Well, Scarpetta was pretty closed mouth too, and I wrote about her for a long time. She never told me anything either. <laughs> Nothing. But I told her everything she wanted to know about me. So. But Callie says, mostly, so she's in her office. She's gone to collect stuff from her office. There's been a breach. There's already questioned about who's been in there, if somebody's been in there. You know, from the moment the book begins, something's off. And so from the moment, there's, she is, she, you know, it's constant uh, calibrations about the way safety people think. It's a constant calibrating. And so she says, very unlike you, she's in her office, she says, mostly what I keep in here is what one might expect of a federal special agent, gear and weapons, a desk with computers facing the corner windows, angled so I can scan Langley Boulevard, and it surrounds while my back is never to the door. <clears throat> There's nothing else in my office that would tell people much about me. I don't believe in revealing more than necessary. As little as possible is my mantra. Even if I didn't feel that way, there's no room for, quote, I love me clutter. And grabbing my backpack and gear bag, I walk out to the hallway. Now, I will tell you a little secret, since this is an intimate group. Whatever we say in here stays in here. Oh, that is such a lie. I know. <laughs> So was my childhood, but we'll get there later. Um, I'm one of those people that sits with my back to the corner of a room. I am, I have not actually been aggressed in a horrible way. I've not been the victim of any real assault. 
And yet, I relate to you and this character so much. But this is, but you, you she is like that. I've been places uh, with her. I, I, mean, I, so I have there's already an exit. clocked where the exits are in this building. Yeah. I, you would never know this about me, but I am, like when you described that, my back is never to the door. My thing is here. I am always like, I see the guy over there. I see the guy there. I see the guy. Like, I'm always watching. And for someone like me, this book was fantastic because it was so much like the way I think. And I therefore was like, oh, I'm not alone. And then I knew you had written it. Well, of here's a news flash. Here's a news <coughs> flash, Jamie. Yeah. Okay. Because you've been famous since before you were born. You probably have always been under surveillance, just like she is, and that might be why you feel that way. Because you, you know, just, yeah, just possibly. Yeah. No. 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 I just have. <laughs> I've been that person. I am always the girl with my back to the back to a wall. I walk in a big room, turn my back immediately, face out. I triangulate. I'm never in the middle of a room. I am never with somebody able to come up you're, behind me. You're, 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 you're a space traveler, see? <laughs> nope. That's, and you, you wondered, the, why you is have Jamie the vigilance. here tonight? And now you know, I'm a space traveler. You are a space traveler. You have um, the vigilance of somebody that has to do that. Um, this, but it, it, this also resonated. <clears throat> um, they're talking about to defend our defenses, to predict and prevent an unwanted event before the thought takes form. If you want to know what would be most effective, I say what I always have, take a look at what's already been done. Take a look at nature. That's your best model. And when an animal attacks, what does it do? It goes after the face, the eyes, the mouth, and the ears. Not just animal, any smart predator will do that, Dick says. No matter how powerful our missiles or guns, without the ability to communicate, to receive and transmit, we are no match for the enemy. And to me, that scared the living shit out of me. Because that, to me, is the biggest concern. And that's where technology in the future scares me. It should scare you. It should scare you, but we have to. This, this one of the reasons I, I want to tell these stories is I want people to understand all these things and this in this these kinds of, of, of disciplines of science of technologies. Not just because quote it's cool, but this really is our survival. You know, people don't realize how many thousands of satellites and things are out there. We have stuff orbiting every planet in our solar system, um, and we're, there will be things on the moon in the very near future. Well, you better make sure that whatever's up there is something we're okay with. Because how are you going to like it if you're driving to work and suddenly your GPS is knocked out or it's knocked out in the aircraft you're flying because somebody does that to a satellite up there? We are so dependent on the things that are above us now. And we, we're going that way whether we want to or not, so we should go there intelligently and with force, and people need to be informed. And I hope you fall in love with it as much as I do, because it's really interesting and fun, but it's also extremely important. Um, this is not just because it's cool to walk on the moon. It's because we better be walking on the moon, and we better be walking on a lot of places. And you're not going to stop this movement this way. It's not going to ever stop. So we better be part of it in an intelligent way and be behind it. Well, I can tell you, I live, I'm assuming most of us are from Los Angeles. I have AT&T. Um, and, yeah, thanks. And, you know, I, I, I live on the west side of L.A., and, you know, I'm like every other person now alive. I'm in my car. I have a phone. I find it's a good time to talk to people I've talked to. I can't keep a phone conversation going, a solid conversation going, ever. It always cuts out, it always stops, there's always dead spots, there's that horrible where you know somebody's saying something important and you can't hear it. And you know what popped into my mind when I was reading the book, of course, is ground control to Major Tom. You know, it, you know, your circuit's dead, there's something wrong, can you hear me? This idea of being able to communicate, 
we take, as you said, totally for granted all of this stuff. Now, I personally use uh, Thomas Brothers maps, and I am, <clears throat> I am actually MapQuest in human form. So should any of you ever need or want to know how to get from anywhere to anywhere, please. She's known for cutting up alleyways and doing whatever I, she wants. I go backwards down alleyways yes. in order to avoid certain things. So, you know, my kids and everyone are like, just use ways. Isn't it amazing how, this is how we all talk to each other. Just use ways. And I'm like, I am fucking ways. <laughs> Like, I don't need your ways, but my... I am Google. I don't I need Google. I am Google, exactly. But, and I quote, if we lose the ability to communicate with an asset and can't control it, he continues to confide now that he doesn't outrageously think I'm karma pulling the wool over his eyes, whether it's our new super rocket or a human being equally capable of doing great harm, we're screwed. And this idea of losing the ability to communicate. In the book, they can't find Karma. They can't find her, the twin. She is off the grid. She's not communicating. And this idea of communication, the idea of loss of communication, keeping it going, is a fascinating world to set a kind of murder, mystery, you know, like a, like a suspense, deeply suspenseful And book. also knowing who's communicating with you when they are, because these days, we, I mean, I'm sure some of you know, oh, exactly. but the Good spoofing point. technologies or any, it, it, in this invisible world with texting, with Twitter, with everything, you're not always really, are you really sure who you're dealing with out there? You know, I've made some friends off of Twitter. You know, you, you somebody that you admire. Be careful. You know, well, no, but, no, 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 what, for, but I. It's the devil. But yes, I know. <laughs> but, but for example, uh, one famous person that uh -oh. I got to know this way, and we finally we finally met for lunch. And when we both walked into the this place in London, I said, "This is where you find out that neither one of us are who we said we are." Because uh -huh. how do you know? So, but this is part of what this is playing with: is what's <clears throat> real, what isn't real, and what do you believe, and 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 how do you sort through all this? Whether it's quote fake news or something that you're getting and you're not sure who it's really from and are you being hacked or, or what, what's going on? It's a different way of looking at things. I mean, it is our world. By the way, the, all of that, what she said, <laughs> in the midst of a nor'easter, a breach at NASA, a launch, all and dead people. And a spacewalk that has a really big problem. And a spacewalk that has a really big problem, and more dead people. <laughs> and how did they get dead? And who made them dead? You know, someone always does die in my books. I'm just going to tell you that, so get used to it. Can't help and it. did they dead themselves? That was a good question. And, and actually, that is, that is proper pathological language. Did they dead themselves? Yeah, and should they have, yes. Come on! Yeah, I like that. And we should let's start some new language now. I am. I'm telling you, Live Talks is going to be calling every day now. <laughs> wow. How did you know that language? Um, but my point is, <clears throat> all of what we're discussing, which is so deep and terrifying, communication, control, loss of both, in the midst of you know, cyclones, really, literally, like storms and launches and so much propulsion. You see, I have to really, I've got to, I mean, I'm having a little bit fun with all the action now because, you know, I didn't get to have You're as having much. a Scarpetta lot of fun. Scarpetta didn't really have all the storms and the nor'easters <laughs> and the shutdowns as she's heading to the crime scene. I said, I'm just going to pull out all the stops now. Yes, well, you did. <laughs> and it makes for a very intense read is the term I would describe um, the process of reading. Now, I am not a fan of intensity in reading. I, that, it gives me agita and makes me very anxious. So I will tell you that you succeeded. Oh. And I'm glad that you felt Well, it relieved. made me really anxious when I was writing it too, but probably for different reasons. <laughs> I'm glad that you relieved yourself from the handcuffs 
of Scarpetta and gave yourself like this sort of... Um, Speaking of handcuffs, um, <laughs> you see, when, when I started hanging out with the NASA police and I you know, had to learn more about just regular policing, not starting with detectives who don't really cuff people as much as the other police maybe do at times. And I, so I, so Kim starts giving me lessons in how you put handcuffs on people. And then she says, I'm going to give you a couple pairs of them so you can practice at home. And then she gives me a key. Well, I have the key on my keychain now because I'm afraid I'm ever going to practice and lock myself in and lose the key. But I don't know what anybody thinks of me that I walk around with a handcuff key on my keychain now. <laughs> so you see how my, I'm, this is, it, it's just sort of destroying everything I ever thought about myself, really. I think doing all this. I played a police officer in a movie once. Um, How did you do with the handcuffs? Called Blue Steel. Yes, and I saw that. <laughs> yeah. I played a, a rookie New York City police officer who at one point has to uh, handle and cuff a very large man uh, on her own. And I snap those suckers down. Well, listen, when you come visit, I will practice. Mommy I have a few pairs. Was, I did you. practice a lot. It's a, there's an action to it. It's really quite... Yeah, anyway. they sit around and practice. We dig I'm digressing. Yeah. We're talking now uh, movies. Almost, um, no, almost no one gets bored when you bring up the subject of handcuffs, just so you know. Because there's so many places you can go with it. What else can I say? Um, <laughs> as much as there are, as I said, nor'easters and spacewalks and launches and dead people and breaches in a very secure environment where all of the safety measures and access cards are meticulously um, logged and monitored. Um, in the midst of all of it, heart racing, the car drive to, that, to her family house where maybe her sister is, maybe her sister isn't. You know, the anxiety, very palpable. You also said to me once that quantum isn't about what we do or how we catch the bad guy. It's about who we are. Well, I want you to elaborate more about the humanity part of it because we're all really into those specific heart-pounding parts of it. It's why we all love these kinds of books. But you as a writer are so skilled in a much bigger picture, message, uh, delivery, you know, it's a delivery system for something beyond the simple, not simple, complicated stories you weave. And, and what is that that you were talking about? Well, you know, the, I, I have a strange, there's something strange about me in the sense that I have to, I, I want to dissect existence and try to understand it better, not just why we die or why we do d bad things to cause each other harm or death, like I've explored for years in the Scarpetta books and others. But, but who are we, and why are we here, and why do we do anything, and why do we try hard or not try hard? And what, you know, I think most people in this room would agree that we have a very strong sense of our existence, but yet we all live with every moment that we're aware, you know, we live with that this is a very finite existence. And it's scary. And I look at myself, I go, how am I, how is the years going by this fast? And um, what, what is this all about? And this has caused me to wonder, because you know, I grew up very steeped in Bible stories and of course read a lot of, 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 of all kinds of stories. And I was very struck by things like Star Trek that she doesn't seem to know about. Um, well, it was naughty, apparently. It was very naughty. And I read Coffee, Tear Me. And, and The Wizard of Oz. Um, and, and so many things, you know, in literature are about the journey, you know, Paradise Lost or Canterbury Tales or you're on the road and you meet other people with burdens and you help each other along the way. Follow the yellow brick road. Where are we going? Following it to what? Maybe to get back where we belong? Well, where's that? Well, the more you study about science and the more you know about Earth and the more you know about other planets, the more you start asking questions. And I'll just say, for example, Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for create, you know, discovering the double helix in DNA, he, he wrote a paper in the early 1970s proposing that the life on Earth was deliberately planted here by a higher, more highly evolved 
beings from another place. Now, that may sound cuckoo to people, but is it really? Because we're beginning to do the same things. When we talk about the animal model, if you want to create a good camouflage, you watch what a squid does. You watch what some of these creatures do that can disappear right in front of you. And that's what, that's what the kind of skins we should be putting on our airplanes and our fighter planes and our spacecrafts maybe someday. What the animals do, they do really well. Well, what makes you think that what we're doing now hasn't been done by others? It may be a whole lot better than we're doing it right now, I might add. I want to consider all these things. They don't have to be incompatible with what you were taught to believe when you're growing up. It just means that maybe there's different meanings to some of this. Um, and most of all, by looking at these things and looking up, as we say, I want to encourage people to go farther than they have, to think more positively, to try harder, to, to look at yourselves and realize you may have far greater potential than you ever believed, and you might be far more important than you ever thought. I want to make people hope that people will think that way, because that's how I believe. And the more I've been doing all this, the more I believe that way. It, um, I'm, and I don't, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but I don't miss the morgue particularly right now. Um, well, fuck. <laughs> I, I'm, I, like, I was just like all of you all. I was just like, I'm, you could talk about this for hours. And I would, I think, along with all of you, just. It's just when you start finding out the facts, and if you're so lucky that you can hang out with these smart NASA people like I do, and you start reading these articles too, and you realize things like that, things like platinum may not be indigenous to this planet. They came from somewhere else. That not that so many things here are not from here, including us. We're all made of stardust. We're all made from everything, from everywhere. Um, and, and one of the most important things about realizing that is we can't do anything that matters without doing it together. You know, in NASA, in the NASA world, if you want to, the more antennas you have, the, you create an array. And when you create an array, now you've got something powerful. A lot more powerful than just one. And it's, we need to be more aware of that because we need to all join forces and be on the same side and help each other and realize that we all, um, you need your audience, I need my audience. Um, you, you need what I do, I need what you do. We all need each other. And interdependency. It's an interdependency yeah. and, an, and a, a mutual celebration. I celebrate you and I'm pleased if you celebrate me. And so I just feel that we can do better. And I'm here to see if I can help with that a little bit by showing you pictures of yourself, not, not of what I want you to know, but what I think we are and can be. Um, and I think you're going to find it fun, too. I mean, come on, going to space is kind of cool, isn't it? Who wants to go? You want to go? I'm okay, we'll take you in the next book. You also want to go. Yeah. You should all want to go. It wants you to go. Space looks good on you. Um, but you're also, weirdly enough, like an expert on death. Like... I can tell you almost anything possible that I know. you want to know about what would so, kill you, should kill you, has so, killed you, might do it again, whatever you want to know. Given your background, where did the death obsession, because, you know, I'm sure many people here also read the Ripper book. You know, my sister, it's like her Bible. My sister reads that book. I've told you, my sister is like obsessed with that book. Um, it's one of those, it didn't end the way she wants. She keeps reading it again, hope it will end differently. Just, or, uh, she just is fascinated by it over and over and over again. She cannot stop talking well, about I it. Well, I just call him Jack the Ripoff because I know it's true. That I know who it is, but nobody <coughs> seems to listen to me, so I feel cheated, but anyway. But so where, where did it come from? I, I'm not really sure. Um, I remember having a... I, I think when I, when I finally started doing the police reporting right after college... And I remember the first time rolling up where the, the, the medical examiner, <clears throat> who was someone you never met and never answered my phone calls, um, I, I, I remember the first time rolling up on a scene as the medical examiner and some people were carrying this dead body out of the woods. And I can remember seeing that it was that now I would know that it had been there for a while, it had gone into rigor mortis, and now it's out of rigor mortis, so it's kind of flopping around if you want to know the gory details. And I was sitting back in my staff car, and I could see this from a distance, and I was like, Ugh, 
you know, I'd never seen a dead body before. And the reality of this, that was, uh, that was what started doing it. I became fascinated in what did they do with the body, where did they take it, and what for. And then as I got, then years went by and I get more and more into it, and I've seen thousands of cases of this eventually. And I remember thinking, I remember one day a body came into the morgue and the person had not been dead very long at all. And he looked exactly like his driver's license picture, except that it was like a light bulb that was turned off. It's like a light fixture, looked just like itself, except there was no light in it anymore. And I thought, that's so weird. What, what made him him? Because that's here. That ain't him. What was there has left the building. But where'd it go? What is it? Well, we're, everything's about energy. And, you know, the forces of nature are nuclear forces, gravity, and, and electromagnetic energy. And electromagnetic energy is what's racing around. If you could see it in this room right now, you'd go crazy because it's all over the place. <coughs> Signals, frequencies. And this is, what makes you think that's not what we are? I don't, you know, if you start, I just challenge you to start absorbing some of this, play with it, and see what thoughts that you have, because I know that I've had a lot of unusual thoughts about, and I know that our flesh dies, but if you think for one minute that I think we stop existing, no way. Nope, especially not the stuff that I'm seeing, uh-uh. Nope. And that's why I want people to believe that you are a, you know, that we are, that, that we're remarkable. That, that our lives count, that we're more than just the bodies that we walk around in. These are our spacesuits, whatever you want to call them. And find that, find who you are. And celebrate that and don't give up on it. And it's eternal. You can call it a soul, you can call it energy. I don't care what you call it. I believe that. And, and I didn't. I ran, I, you know, for a lot of years I wasn't sure because so many things didn't make much sense to me. Hmm. And I know this may sound strange. I just think I've found something that, that I'm very excited about. Oh, you're clearly excited about it. I mean, again, heart pounding the read of this book. It's just inc you're so turned on by the by the conundrum of the book. That would be a good title for one of your books. Conundrum. That's so it'd be a good name for a villain that always tricks you and fools Ooh, you. Oh, maybe I'll play her. Yeah. Oh. Conundrum. Um, you can play anything you want, Jamie, oh, okay, whatever. Okay, thanks. Uh, but I'm, but it's, I mean, obviously, your passion for the subject matter and for the possibilities of all of this. You know, I'm a, I, I'm, I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a much more limited thinker. I just am. I mean, it's fine, but I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not an expansive thinker like that. And I love the passion that you bring to that discourse, to that exploratory idea of not taking something at, quote, face value, at not stopping at this, but continuing to seek it. And it's imbued in the book throughout. And now, I'm guessing, in the next book, are we going to go up a little? Oh, yeah. Okay. So ultimately, the humans that we are meeting on the ground here, ultimately. Well, you, well, you want to, you want, oh, sorry, I just touched my own mic and I made a big boom. Sorry about that. That didn't sound right either. But um, <laughs> it, the, the thing that, what happened about this is that, you know, we're, when we talk about movies and TV and when things get turned into all this, and um, I was talking to the, the producer, David Heyman, and we were talking about quantum, and, and he said, well, you know, you've, you've got to get her up into space. And I said, well, I was, I'm going to get her up into space, but I was going to wait a little while, because, you know, in case you hadn't noticed, there's not a whole lot of people going up into space right now. I mean, we have them on the space station, and some of them are here. Um, not the space station itself, but some of the people who've been on it. And, be, and there, we're going to be sending people to the moon and maybe to Mars, but we're not really doing that quite yet. So, and I have not had that kind of experience. So I said, well, not, not so soon. And, oh, yes, you need to get Captain Chase into space in the next book. And so I said, well, that just can't possibly happen. So then I called my astronaut friend, Peggy Whitson, who, and, and I said, you know, I, I, I don't think we can, I can't get her into space in the next book. And she said, yeah, you, yeah, we can. I said, we can? She said, yeah, we can get her in there. I said, okay, well, Let's get working on it, I guess, somehow. So we're going to do it. You're going to get him into space. Don't worry. So and you're working on the next Chase oh. book? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Any any secrets? Again, nothing's oh, going to leave this room. You just trust. Oh, trust me, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what I'm going to say. Let's just put it this way. She's minding her own business at Mission Control at the end of this book, but what happens on her way home in the next one is not anything that you're going to believe. Um, before, I mean, I, okay, before, um, I don't have timing, and so I, no one has come up and zapped me with one of those cattle prods yet, but I, the, there, there is something extraordinary that happens in this book, and it involves energy in these... The pongs. Okay. So, what starts out, as I said, they're dead people, and deadnesses and liquids and all the gross stuff. That people who makes dead each dead, other. Dead, deadness, yeah. dead. But then it sort of elevates into this um, dance, if you will, between Callie and this. Well, it's called a pong, which is which, a... Which you invented. Well, I didn't invent the actual drone-type technology. I simply took that technology and created a personal, special drone. Because, you see, oh, the other thing I didn't tell you is the Chases, the, the two girls, they grew up on this little farm uh, on the river in Hampton, Virginia. And they, it's an old, old farm and an old barn that's converted into a monster garage where you can imagine with these NASA people what they're doing in there, Willy Wonka having a good time. And so they got their own little drones and stuff they're making. And, and um, this one that you meet that's called a Pong, it's a, it's a personal orb, not grounded, meaning it flies around, P-O-N-G, acronyms. NASA is horrible, notorious acronyms, God help me. Um, they have acronyms for acronyms for acronyms. So, but... So yes, yeah, she gets home in one of the pongs, because they were making 12 of these for the mom for a special Christmas thing. They, I mean, they had a special thing. But one of them is missing. And of course, when she's in the bathroom finally cleaning up, this thing, was something knocking on the door of the bathroom door, alone in the barn where her bedroom is. And that's kind of scary. And she opens the door, and this little mirror ball comes floating in. And uh, I, won't, I don't want to give it away because the mirror balls. Yeah, it's it's but it's such a beautiful combo between the sort of gritty reality of the 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 all of the human stuff. She's freezing. She's wet. She's gross. She needs to change. All of these descriptions of the the crime scenes and these. It's either claustrophobic or it's super high up in the... It's like, it's beautifully designed. And yet there's this sort of magic moment. I was transfixed by the poem because the great thing about a book is you, it's your imagination. So you have given us this gift of what does that look like? What is it really doing? Do they exist? Could they exist? What would I do if an orb all of a sudden like was, and I realized it was a re my sister or a relationship or something? The only way that can communicate. She had to hack into her own thing and, and give her a it's message. It's such a beautiful, there's such beautiful poetry about the difficulties in relationships because it's a book about two sisters. And I have a sister. And fabulous, and I would. Take well, I have two brothers, and they're here somewhere, and they were not a cakewalk either. But so. I would, I, I would take <laughs> a thousand bullets for my sister. I would step in front of a billion trains and buses. But she was a little difficult. <laughs> but that's the beauty of in the book these relationship between these sisters. Um, it's it's really beautiful, and 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 then for one of them to turn into. <laughs> On some level, this 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 orb was. It's, it's also playing with the whole notion. This is not really deliberate because then it gets forced. But it's it what it does play with is the whole notion of different dimensions. If you have identical people, I mean they look identical, and then, and they really can't tell them apart. And one is here and one is there, and they can't seem to be with each other. 
because, and you'll find out why uh, later, but there's, they, they just can't be together. But that it's, it makes you wonder if, if it's possible, like when people die, are they really gone or just in a different dimension? You know, it makes you think about a lot of things when people are separated, but yet they can send signals to each other somehow to let them know they're okay, but they can't be with each other. What I, I, I have a little, I call it mirror flashes. And people have had experiences like this when they've lost, lost a loved one, and they have these strange moments, almost like that somebody's trying to let you know something. Or, or, and is it really strange? And I don't believe in ghosts. I believe that almost anything supernatural or magical can be explained by science, and if you don't, and, and just because you can't explain it by science doesn't mean there's not an explanation, it just means we don't know what it is yet. We still don't really know what dark matter is, but it makes up like 80% of the mass, I think, of the universe, but we don't, because it doesn't react at all to light, we don't really know what it is, but that doesn't mean it's not something there. Um, I think it's simply the matrix of the computer program that is, we're on, and that when I die and wake up, and there's gonna be these MIT dudes, and I'm gonna say, you are in so much freaking trouble putting me through all that for your stupid experiment. Um, so, but anyway. But didn't, didn't, um, didn't they send up uh, the two astronaut brothers? Didn't they send the one Kelly to brothers? Yes, and they sent one up to space. They've done, they've, to, uh, NASA, to, NASA does a lot of twin to study, studies. Well, twin yeah. study, well, twin studies have been done you know, throughout But especially history. you have one twin in space and well, one that, not, so right. that they try to, you know, that, that's a huge part. And this is why for those who want careers in this, there's so many different aspects of it, you know, such as how does living in that environment affect the human body? And how is it, you know, if you're living with no gravity, um, and the gravity's the big part, and you probably, you know, they have to do all these workout like two hours a day up there because they lose so much bone mass. I mean, it's a really big deal how it changes you. We weren't meant to live in that environment. Um, and so there, all of that, I think it's interesting. But yet we sure do want to go there. We, we, we don't, we, it's, we don't, we're not adapted to living there on our own by any means, but we sure do want to go there. Well, I'll tell you this. I want to go there if I only get to do it through your eyes. So I think, speaking, I believe, for the assembled mass, that I only want to go there with you, and I want you to be the guide. I want you to navigate the trip. I want you to plan the whole thing. <laughs> I will check in. And, and go on the ride with you. But as far as I'm concerned, um, what you did with Scarpetta and morgues and, and uh, a world I never thought I'd be interested in, and you made me interested in it, you have done the same. You have piqued interest. You have opened my, the possibility in my mind of something more expansive. And I, I know I speak for all of your fans that when you say, we're, you know, we're going to go up there, we're going to go up there only with you. Well, I'm taking you. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> Patricia Cornwell. Thank you.